के दुलारे यशोधा के प्यारे नंद के दुलारे यशोधा के प्यारे गोविंद मुरारे दिनों के सहारे गोविंद मुरारे दिनों के सहारे नंद के दुलारे शोधा के प्यारे करुणा सागर गिरिधर नागर करुणा सागर गिरिधर नागर मुरली मनोहर प्याही मुरारे मुरली मनोहर पाही मुरारे नंद के दुलारे शोधा के प्यारे मेरा के प्रभु गिरिधर नागर मेरा के प्रभु गिरिधर नागर राधा मनोहर पाही मुरारे राधा मनोहर पाही मुरारे नंद के दुलारे शोधा के प्यारे यशोधा के प्यारे
ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೋ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಸಮಸ್ತ ಜನಕಲ್ಯಾಣೇನಿರತ ಕರುಣಾಮಯ ನಮಿ ಚಿನ್ಮಯ ದೇವ ಸದ್ಗುರು ಬ್ರಹ್ಮವಿತ್ವರಂ ಓಂ ಪಾರ್ಥಯ ಪ್ರತಿಬೋಧಿ ಭಗವತ ಣೇನ ಸ್ವಯಂ ವ್ಯಾಸೇನ ಗ್ರತಿ ಪುರಾಣ ಮುನಿ ಮಧ್ಯೆ ಮಹಾಭಾರತ ಅದ್ವೈತಾಮೃತವರ್ಷಿ ಭಗವತಿ ಅಷ್ಟಾಧ್ಯಾಯಿ ಅಂಬತ್ವಾಮನುಸಂತ ಭಗವದ್ಗೀತೆ ಭವತ್ವೇಷಿ ಯಂ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮವರುಣೇಂದ್ರರುದ್ರಮರುತ ಸ್ತುನ್ವಂತಿ ದಿವ್ಯೈ ಸ್ತವೈ ವೇದೈ ಸಾಂಗಪದ ಕ್ರಮೋಪನಿಷದೈ ಗಾಯಂತಿ ಯಂ ಸಾಮಗಾ ಧ್ಯಾನಾವಸ್ಥಿ ತದ್ಗತೇನ ಮನಸ ಪಶ್ಯೋಗಿನೋ ಯಸ್ಯಾಂತುರಾಸುರಗಣ ದೇವಾಯ ತಸ್ಮೈ ನಮಃ ದೇವಾಯ ತಸ್ಮೈ ನಮಃ ದ ಡಿಸ್ಕ್ರಿಪ್ಷನ್ ಆಫ್ of the man of wisdom and this is a very important section of gita that is to say bhagavan is trying to explain his nature because as gurudev would say a man of such great enlightenment cannot be recognized by any external description you would say it's not that such a man of wisdom start growing some two horns or anything <laughs> how do we know that such a person is enlightened an enlightened person would not say i am enlightened because that i in him has disappeared huh? just like a person who is sleeping would not say i am sleeping <laughs> can you say are you sleeping yes <laughs> that means you are not sleeping in him the ego is not there therefore he cannot say i am enlightened often when people asked gurudev are you enlightened he said no i am waiting for you <laughs> let us go together <laughs> so how do we know what is the nature of an enlightened person so we have to refer to this second chapter of bhagavad gita last 18 verses as i said yesterday siddhasya lakshanani sadakasya sadhanani the nature of an enlightened person or characteristics when known it should become our practice sadakasya sadhanani now what is wisdom knowledge experienced is wisdom that's why vedanta the very word ವೇದಾಂ ಅಂತ ಅಂತ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ಎಂಡ್ ವೇದ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ನಾಲೆಡ್ಜ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಎ ಎಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಎನಿ ನಾಲೆಡ್ಜ್ ಈಸ್ ಎಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ನಾಲೆಡ್ಜ್ ಇಗ್ನೋರೆನ್ಸ್ ವಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಎಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಲೈಟ್ ಡಾರ್ಕ್ನೆಸ್ ದಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಇಸ್ ಅಪೋಸ್ ಟು ಒನ್ ಈಸ್ ದ ಎಂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಇಟ್ ಸೊ ಇಫ್ ಯು ಸೇ ಡಾರ್ಕ್ನೆಸ್ ಈಸ್ ವೆನ್ ದ ಲೈಟ್ ಈಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ದೇರ್ ದೇರ್ ಇಸ್ ಡಾರ್ಕ್ನೆಸ್ but here veda which means knowledge anta means end what is the end of knowledge ignorance then nobody will pursue knowledge here end of knowledge i do not mean by the absence of it by fulfillment of it so 
so the end of like end of wake end of sleep is what waking up that is opposed to it but end of knowledge is experience a knowledge without experience is a burden today morning also we saw that so jnanam swayam nashyet jalam katakarenu vat knowledge ends in releasing you making you free forever so therefore wisdom is knowledge experienced if knowledge is not has not become an experience it is vicarious it is only a mere information and today's world we are in the information boom every kind of information is bombarded in us and we do not have the ability even to dissect what we want what we do not want so therefore it is necessary that the knowledge should be given to us by an enlightened person thereby we know exactly what is important to us you can go to a library and read all the books but still you may miss the point <laughs> but a person who has an experience he doesn't have to go through all the books once ramana maharshi was asked this question how many upanishads we should read to understand the import of vedanta he said how many mirrors you have to see to know your face how many only one is sufficient so you go deeper in only one then you will understand it and that is where the guru's role is seen very important gukaro andakarastu rukarastha nivartakatvat so gu and yesterday on that during our <laughs> he asked that question gu means darkness ru means that which removes it guru so gurudev was asked this question by a person swami ji what is the need for any guru we have so many books available in the libraries etc why do we need to have a guru it's all waste gurudev smiled and said why don't you ask that question to the book <laughs> book cannot answer you back guru the books cannot remove your doubt so when you meet an obstacle or a doubt who can remove that so a teacher who has a personal experience can alone remove your doubts not only that it will, he will be able to give you exactly what you need otherwise you have to go on searching in your entire life in whole of the library everywhere still you will not find an answer so therefore in this portion of bhagavad gita we have taken only one verse from the entire 18 verses set set up in 18 verses only to show an example so in the verse number 7 we see here prajahadiyata kaman sarvan parthamano gatan atman evatmana tushtah stita pragnastadochyate yada when followed by what tada then like in english also when i went there then you stop the sentence <laughs> then what happened <laughs> so it has to be followed with tada then yada when sarvan manogadan kaman prajahati sarvan all manogatan mind born kaman desires prajahati one gives up tatha then atmani eva atmana tushtah one who is content and happy with one's own self then is called sthita prajna he is called a man of wisdom sthita means steady prajna wisdom in sanskrit gnya is to know gnya gnanam knowledge 
we in general when we read a book any text any book it's called jnanam right it is knowledge but when we go deeper into a particular subject to know very carefully and analyze that it's called vijnanam huh? it is a science so everything has become a science nowadays in every every field there is a speciality one fellow went to a ophthalmologist and said i have a problem with the right eye he said i am a left eye specialist go to another fellow <laughs> specialization in everything so specialization is vijnana going deeper into a particular subject matter so gnanam knowledge vijnanam is special knowledge v means vishesha so vijnanam but to gnanam to take place or to the vijnanam to take place what is most important is pragnanam awareness like if i am seeing a stone or i am seeing something a table a chair a flower a stone or a mountain that is seeing is taking place i come to know oh, yes there is a tree there there is a mountain there there is a river here what is this mountain what is this tree and i can go deeper into that also but even to gnanam to take place or even to vijnanam to take place i must be an aware full living being a conscious living being is it not this uh, tumbler of or glass of water does not know my presence that's why it is still sitting there i wish it would have gone long time back <laughs> because inert matter it is it doesn't have awareness this table which is in front of me does not have awareness otherwise it would have gone long time back on it's very boring but i i am not only i am present but i am aware fully present consciously present this consciousness which makes me learn anything which is gnanam or go deeper into anything else vijnanam is because pragnanam vai brahma i am that pragnanam awareness i am not inert thing i am not only mere existence i am aware full existence conscious existence i am aware of my own presence therefore it is said aham asmi aham bhami meaning i exist and i know my existence this exists it doesn't know its existence ha huh? aham asmi i am aham sada bhami meaning i also know my existence this one exists but doesn't know its existence and therefore he cannot learn anything whereas i not only i exist i know my existence i know the existence of everything else other than me too from where i derive my joy or happiness and all the experiences this awareness of my own existence is what is known as pragnanam without pragnanam gnanam tat gnanam cha vijnanam na bhavati so knowledge as well as science of that knowing is not they are not possible unless you are aware of yourself so this is called pragnanam sthita pragnya meaning he is constantly aware of his own awareness now we are also aware we are aware that i have this body and i am sitting in a in a hall you know once the teacher asked this question my student where are you so the student said i am in front of you where are you sitting on the carpet where is the carpet in the hall where is this hall it is in saket there is saket city is this is it dallas okay dallas i thought plano plano is this in dallas where is dallas texas where is texas united states where is united states american continent where is american continent 
in the world earth where is earth the galaxy where is the galaxy the whole universe where is the universe in space right where is the space where is space in my mind without that mind you cannot understand that there is space where is your mind in the body where is the body sitting on the carpet <laughs> so then you come back to the whole point here the mistake that you made is the space is you said that in the mind and mind is inside the body that is where you made the mistake there mind is in awareness and in that awareness is this body it is not outside this it is not inside this body this is a mistake the science makes saying that brain is the abode of awareness it is not so in awareness this physical body and all other things which you consider to be the body mind etc they are all in awareness so where is awareness awareness i am <laughs> that is vedanta so awareness is not a product of thought the western science western philosophy says i think therefore i am which is a fundamental mistake in thinking i am therefore i think so thinking is a product of awareness it takes place in awareness and not that there i am thinking therefore i am aware if you consider you are thinking mechanism only restricted to a brain and the neurons that are fighting or that going in here and there that you consider as a thought or awareness then what you say is right but thought is happening in the presence of awareness and awareness is not a product of a thought so when i see an object so i am aware of this plate when you say the plate awareness takes place hmm? plate awareness takes place and awareness is there even before you understood this plate even as the plate is thrown away awareness does not change so therefore this plate is coming in the scope of awareness and disappears not that only when the plate is there i am aware of myself or there is awareness so if there are no objects at all are you aware when there is an object a flower or a person or a plate or a mountain etc then you say i am aware of this flower aware of this plate aware of the mountain aware of something else but there are nothing to be aware of still awareness continues just like in sleep so when one recognizes oneself as the awareness even in the absence of object that is called objectless awareness which gurudev calls it as the state of meditation objectless awareness which means subject alone is the subject being awareness alone is presently our our experience is only in terms of subject being in touch with an object and between the subject and object the transaction that takes place is what is called a thought a thought necessarily has to have a subject i and must have an object of thought a thing anyway i do not want to squeeze your head too much on that but <laughs> the concept therefore is awareness exists independent of objects but our experience presently is only when there is an object we are aware of awareness the attempt of vedanta is to realize the existence of awareness independent of the object and that is why in the seat of meditation one is expected to withdraw all objects if this is clear in your mind he who is constantly abiding by this pure awareness independent of objects is called sthita pragnya hmm.
This does not require any particular idea of God, faith, religious backgrounds, and none of those are required. Therefore, spirituality is a PhD program of religion. It does not necessarily talk about any God or concept. But for the sake of the common man to understand, a person has to walk through the halls of religious values before he enters into spirituality. Because religion gives discipline. So now, one who is therefore constantly aware of his own nature as awareness independent of objects is called Siddha Prajna. How did he achieve that? Or what is the benefit of reaching there? Atmanyevatmana Santushta. He is content with his own being, not depending upon anything else for his happiness. For one who has become aware of his own existence, awareness, does not require any other thing to become happy. And all our case, in our case what happens, since we have not discovered this awareness, our happiness is something else. And that when you attribute happiness in something else, that becomes your object of desire. We desire something only because we think there is happiness in that. Would you desire something which gives you pain? Can you? You cannot. Any object of your desire is an object of joy. Yes. You cannot realize, you cannot because there is no instrument to uh, prove it. This is why it becomes metaphysics. The meta means beyond. So physics and metaphysics. Because the metaphysics is that area where it cannot be proven in any laboratory. It cannot be proven by any objective experimentation. That is the reason why these masters have sat in meditation to have a subjective experience which as Gurudev would say cannot be explained in any physical method. That's why I would say Atman is not a test tube thing and you can show it. This is Atman. You pass it around. Let them all see it. <laughs> you cannot because it is not something which can be experienced externally. But what is then proof for it? All masters who have experienced have experienced the same thing. For their declarations are the same. Whether it is today or 100 years back, thousand years back, here or any part of the world. When Christ said, I am that I am, he refers to Aham Brahmasmi only. I am that I am. And nobody understood what he is saying there. I am that I am. I am that pure awareness. So therefore, you see, this, uh, when we have kept a idea of notion of joy in some object that becomes an object of desire. But on the other hand, a person who has discovered the inner fulfillment joy of awareness, Atmani Eva Atmana Santushtaha, one who is content with his own, his own self, for him any amount of desire, I mean objects outside is only so insignificant. I used to like Rasagulla. No, it's not selfish. No, selfish, if you say, it is not self-centered. It is not that I don't care about anything else. But he who has discovered the joy, he can infinitely give joy to everybody else. You see, I can give happiness only when I am happy with something. But one who has happen, one who has found happiness as himself, infinitely available for everybody to give that joy. Like for example, if there is a businessman and he is doing his business and successful, and if he does not give that money to anybody else, then you can call him selfish. On the other hand, he earns the money and shares with everybody, then he is not considered selfish because he is a channel through which the money gets distributed to the needy. 
Similarly, Mahatmas, they enjoy their own presence. It is not there selfishly sitting in the corner and saying nothing to do with the world. No. They pretty much available to the world and serve the poor and the sorrowful, sorrowful people with great compassion. And that no, nobody, nobody else can do it. Because all else, all others who do serve others have some personal agenda there. <laughs> anyway, so I used to write this Rasagulla. So what happened when I was in Bombay? Uh, late, even, late night after my dinner one day, somebody knocked at my door. And that person said, Swamiji, I just came from Calcutta, Kolkata. So this Rasagulla, whole tin of Rasagulla I brought for you. I was overjoyed, so happy. Oh, very good. Keep it in the fridge tomorrow. I'll take. No, 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 Swamiji. Swamiji, I just brought that I want to see that you are eating tonight. <laughs> no, leave it there. No, I will. No, 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 no. I want to see you. So it's a tin full of Rasagulla. I, I had my dinner a long time back and I was about to retire to the bed. It was already 10, 10.30. I want to see you eating. TK. So he opened that thing and then he took one rasukula. Lelo. So then I took, it was a very such a soft, you know, white, brown ball there. The juicy. And it was, my mouth was watering there. I took one. I was so happy. You liked it? Yes. You were happy? Yes. Rekor lelo. Not okay. I took another one. So I was Calcutta and I was asking him. Happy Swamiji? Yes. Ethisra de Lelo. Nay ne nay chai. No, I will take tomorrow. Nothing. You are you want happiness, right? Take this third one. <sighs> okay. Third one also. Happy? Yes. Fourth one you take. No, enough. Nothing doing. You had to finish this whole ten, <laughs> which were 25 of them. I can't take any more. Why not? See, the, after the fourth or fifth, it's a pain. So real happiness is not really there. It is in the thought that there is happiness. And the wanted object when it is got, your mind which was wanting that suddenly becomes quiet. Till then it was anxious of eating or enjoying that particular object. When the object is gained, the mind has become quiet and when the mind has reached that quietude, that happiness is experienced only in the form of a thought, absence of agitation. Many times when you are very eager to buy something, some equipment, some, uh, what you call, maybe a TV, plasma TV and whatever TV, you go there, buy and then come and open the packet and then fix it over. All the excitement is over. <laughs> what is next? <laughs> because that whole anxiety which was there, I want it, I want it, I want it. And afterward it is gathering dust and nobody is even watching it over. First to two, three days, finished. So is with marriage also. So everything has got a limited span or scope of that joy. Beyond that it is not. So next day I had the, again, see the peculiar thing of this mind is that if you give it for a while and it is happy and afterwards it is, okay, it gives up. After that I am tired, I have to sleep. Rasagula and all tomorrow. After next day, when I finish my eating, and again the thought comes, Rasgulla. <laughs> See, th th that is the nature of the mind. He, he gives up now and again picks up next tomorrow. If I remember, some 20 more Rasgullas are inside this. <laughs> so next day, after I sent all my students away, make sure that nobody is around. <laughs> open that. I took that white Rasgulla. Wow. But the juice is so sugary, you know, so I just want to you know, avoid that. So I took the rasagula and chick, and lo and behold, one black cockroach jumped out of it. Ah. And it was alive. <laughs> it was looking at me. Now what? 
and can you eat afterwards? That day I gave up rasgulla. <laughs> okay, any time I think of rasgulla, one cockroach comes there. No, thereafter I could not take any rasgulla at all. Why? The mind has that abhorrent idea that there is a every rasgulla has got potential possibility of a cockroach sitting. <laughs> now what will you do? You cannot have any more. So, therefore, your mind's idea of notion of joy in that has turned to become a hateful thought. This is what the mind's trick is. Therefore, he says, Yada manogatan kaman. The desires that are in the form of just dharma, only a thought. Prajahati. Point to note here is he doesn't reject the word. Otherwise, you, should, you will be an escapist. You will be running away from things and people. No. Manogatan kaman. Sankalpa prabhavan kaman. Desires are born out of fanciful thinking. A thought, that's why he said, Dhyayato vishayan pamsaha, Sangaste shupajayate, Sangat sanchayate kaman. It is only a thought association. You and I walk, to a, walk into a liquor shop. I am a teetotaler. I am. Don't look at that way. I am a teetotaler. <laughs> so you are not. So you get agitated. I'm, but I am not. Because my idea of joy is not in the bottle. So when you get agitated, I am not. That only clearly shows your mind is making you look for it. But my mind is not at all interested in that. So it is manogadan kamano. Na Indriya Gatan, Na Vishaya Gatan, Mano Gatan. It is only born of your mind. Therefore, a man of steady wisdom is one who is capable of renouncing thoughtful, desireful thoughts from his mind. Thereby, Vairagya is not in rejecting objects of the world. Many people have this misunderstanding. Many, vairagya means run away from it. Quit everything, go away, escape. Sarvam, dukkam, dukkam, shanikam, shanikam. You will be miserable and everybody is miserable around you. So it is the thought of or the notion of desire, I mean joy there somewhere. That notion has to go away. So therefore he says wisdom is for the desireless. The desire is in the form of a thought, a notion. And this mind, when it is empty of these desires, then where does it engage in? Atman, Nevatmana, Tushtaha. In what way? Sthita Pragna, steady awareness. Ever be attentive to that nature of oneself as awareness, which does not require any object. And in fact, only when the mind has become free of desire, one can experience that objectless awareness. Otherwise, some object will be there. And one more thing is, when one is thus sitting for meditation upon that awareness, one should not keep any goal in mind. One should not keep any reason in mind. Why am I sitting for meditation? At the end of it, I will experience it. No. The moment you keep an objective of that awareness, it becomes objectful awareness. So the mind has to remain in that objectless nature and then the awareness in its own accord. Swayam prakasha dehi atma mega payam shumaniva in the atma bodha we saw that. Parichinna iva ajnanat tannashe sati kevalaha Swayam prakasha dehi atma mega apaye amshumaniva. Just like the clouds that are covering the sun makes you not to see the sun, but the beauty is even the clouds we see are because of the sun. How can you know, how do you know that there are clouds? <laughs> the sun is there behind that, therefore you are able to see the cloud. Is the cloud really covering the sun? No, the cloud is only covering your vision. The cloud can never go anywhere near him. In the same way, Pramatma, the self is within, blissfully present, and our 
thoughts and desires are covering our vision of that and those thoughts are removed, desires are removed, then what you see is the beautiful, splendorous awareness present. That is what he said, your Atman Eva, Atmana Atushtaha, one who is ever content within himself. This contentment within himself does not mean he will look down upon others. Just like a person who has money will do look down upon others who do not have. One who has a knowledge, he will look down upon those who do not have that knowledge. But a Sita Prajna does not look down upon anyone because he knows in everyone that awareness is equally present. You see? It is not that I have a bank account and full of money. You do not have. Not in the same way a man of wisdom would conclude that I am Brahman. I do not know about others. <laughs> I know that I am Brahman. I think this is a miserable one. He does not know. Of course, he is not Brahman. He does not. It is not that it is absent in him. He does not know. That's all. Everybody is equally rich with that awareness. Only thing is he is not paying attention to that. So, therefore, a man of such a wisdom is infinitely compassionate. And therefore, anybody comes to ask him, he will have joy of teaching because it is something which you have to remove as your misunderstanding. Now, to caution Arjuna, Bhagavan Krishna says, in the next chapter, chapter 3, which is known as Karma Yoga, in the second chapter towards the end, therefore, he has explained the characteristics of this man of wisdom and obviously he talks about himself. And when he has given the glory of this knowledge which leads to wisdom, Arjuna got confused. If knowledge is the means to attain that absolute, because yasyad nishchitam bruhitan, he asked, please teach me by which I can and again the highest good. And you have said that knowledge, when it turns to become wisdom, gives you the freedom or moksha. If that is so, why should I fight in this war? Why should I fight? This is an obvious question we all will have. Swamiji, you are all talking about Vedanta and how important is this knowledge and it will give you freedom, etc. Then why should we do any other work in this world? Why not all of us become sannyasi? You know, many people ask this question, Swamiji, everybody becomes sannyasi, don't know what will happen, don't worry, everybody won't become. Huh? Because their vasanas would not allow them to do so, their desires would not allow them to do so. So, <laughs> sannyasa or renunciation is not just giving up things, it is a gradual process of rising above your needs and your demands of the mind. And you can expedite this process. This expedition of that process of renunciation happens only when you start where you are. Suddenly do not run away from things. Suddenly do not reject the world. Because knowledge does not happen suddenly. <laughs> it happens gradually, it depends upon the maturity of the person, degree of purity. So therefore, here Bhagavan Krishna is asked by Arjuna, why are you putting me into this terrible action called the war when knowledge can take me to this moksha? Why not I just give up everything and go to this path of knowledge where I can enjoy my inner freedom? Bhagavan only smiles now. He says, you know, escapism is not the way. As he says in the word, verse, next verse, Nakarmanam anarambat Naishkarmyam purushoshnute Nachasanyasana deva Siddhim samadhi gachati Many people consider renunciation is just not working. 
you know once I was introduced I was in a camp and um, when he was I was being introduced so one person said earlier his name was this and this now his name is Swami Ishwarananda so one young boy came to me and said Swamiji yes what was your name when you were normal <laughs> I felt very bad, you know. <laughs> so he has branded me as abnormal fellow. What is your name when you are normal? So when, when the rest of the world is engaged in work, when one doesn't work, sannyas. So not working is sannyas. That is what many people conclude. In fact, Gurudev says that is a very wrong definition because a sannyasin works much more than anybody else. Because his work is not for any particular desired result. Therefore, he will keep working. See, our case what happened? We work till we get the result and then we stop. Don't we? Any work we undertake, any project you take up, you work up till the end of the project. When the result is gone, you stop that work. Sannyasa's work doesn't stop. Because he doesn't work for a result. You, if he works for, okay, this, 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 and after that I stop, that is not going to happen. Therefore, Bhagavan Krishna says, do not misunderstand that renunciation is just not working. Karmanam anarambat, karmanam of action. Anaramba, Aramba means to start. Anaramba, not engaging. Naishkarmyam, actionlessness, nashnute, you would not gain. Actionlessness or the state of freedom is not because you stop working. Nacha sanyasana deva. Not by mere renunciation in the absence of knowledge. Siddhim samadhi You will gain ever that final accomplishment. Siddhi means moksha. So moksha or liberation is not merely by renunciation. And renunciation is not just stop working. Please understand this carefully. Because mere, renunci mere not working is not renunciation and mere renunciation is not going to give you moksha. So therefore, he is indirectly answering the question of Arjuna. Why do you put me into work? Action has a role to play in your life. Provided you know the purpose of action. In our present day's understanding, present understanding is what? When I do an action, there must be a, a purpose which is to gain some result. Right? Any personal goal must be there. I want to make sure that I have retirement plan. I must have this much money in my bank so that I can jolly well retire. And that is our idea. I must have this much amount I'm in the bank and I must have this many houses I should own. I must have this much investment. All those things you have planned. And that is the idea with which you work. Don't you do that? So therefore, our action is always in, in, in terms of what do I get, what do I get, what do I get. And so long as what do I get is not stopped, you will not stop working. So by merely stopping the working, your mind is not going to keep quiet. It is like when you are driving a car and you want to stop and you press the, what you call, the brake, you put the brake while you are not releasing your leg from accelerator. What will happen to that car? You have to remove your leg from the, or your feet from the accelerator and then press the brake, isn't it? You put both of them. Then what will happen? What will happen to the car? Collapse. 
that what happens if you take sannyasa without understanding what it is. So there must be a gradual reduction of the inner aggression. Then you don't need to press the brake of the, uh, put the brake at all, it will stop. You start taking away your leg or feet from accelerator. Naturally, the car will come to a halt. Here, therefore, he says, mere renunciation of action is not sannyasa. That is not actionlessness. Like at the end of the day, when all your work is over, all the work you have been doing is over, and also whatever you have planned to do, you have postponed it to tomorrow. She said something, I have to shout at her tomorrow. Because I am tired now. <laughs> I kept it that in mind. Tomorrow I have to shout. Early morning, as soon as I get up, I have to shout at her. Anyway. So at the end of the day, you finished your work, finished all your, what you call, engagements. Then what happens? Slowly, you get into the state of sleep. It is not that, okay, now I have to sleep. <laughs> doesn't happen. <laughs> it, slowly it happens. And more so if you have a heavy book to read, you know. That's why in the most of the hotels they keep uh, next to the bed, the Bible or Gita. You know why? Can't sleep? Take that book and read. <laughs> You'll surely sleep. <laughs> if not, put us an extra height to the pillow and then sleep. That's not it. So you, <laughs> when you want to sleep, it is a gradual process. It is not sudden. But as even you sleep, it does not mean you are all the actions that you have to do, all the desire have not disappeared. They are only suspended. Next morning you wake up, it again it starts. I am here, <laughs> all the thoughts <laughs> now start now. It is not that way the sannyasa is. Renunciation is not merely stopping your work. It is a reduction of this intensity in your mind. Slowing down in your thought process. And slow reduction of your desires and finally it comes to a point of zero and then naturally no intention to act will take place. For that what is most important is how to give up desire, selfishness while working. While working itself, one should remove his one's desire. That is why he introduced the topic of desireless action. Very, very scientific in his approach. Unlike Buddhism where renunciation is so much emphasized, not karma yoga. Just renounce. Shave your head. Walk down. Walk out. That is a very, very difficult and very unhealthy process of renunciation. Bhagavan, therefore, Shankaracharya very clearly says, Jatilo mundi lunjita keshaha kashayambhara bahukruta vesha. Pashyanna pichana pashyati mooda yudarani mittam bahukruta vesha. What just has shaving your hair or pulling your hair and wearing a saffron cloth does not make you a renunciate for you are doing all these things as an external, mere extravagance, I mean Vesha, only to fill your belly. You are so strongly coming down on that. Because that is not renunciation. Merely wearing a saffron cloth or shaving your head or growing a long beard, that is not renunciation. Our Gurudev used to say, it is not wearing a Rudraksha Mala that makes you religious. Marrying a Rukhdarshan, putting all thoughts of unnecessary things, that, that makes you renunciate. So it is that mind slowing down on its desire and that will not happen merely by running away from action. Act without desire and see your mind. Can it do it? 
so that is karma yoga so he caution sarjuna saying karmanam anarambhat by not doing your work naishkarmyam na ashnute renunciation is not possible and mere sanyasa nacha sanyasanad eva eva means only by only renunciation which means there is no knowledge what is the difference between a beggar and a sanyasi beggar has nothing to do sanyasi has nothing to do beggar has no possession sanyasi has no possession he is also a bhikshu he is also a bhikshu what is the difference this renunciate has renounced these actions because he has no more desires and desires are replaced by knowledge of the higher of the greater awareness and swami tapovanam very clearly said if you are an enunciate without knowledge you are a beggar there is no difference between you and a beggar then pashyanna pichana na pashyati mooda you are seeing yet you don't see so renunciation has to be supported by knowledge without that it is beggary so nacha sanyasanat eva only by renunciation na siddhim samati gachati you will not reach that freedom you understand so therefore first thing is you should understand mere giving up action is not renunciation <coughs> second only renunciation does not lead you to freedom unless you have knowledge backing that otherwise you give up today tomorrow you will pick it up again like we do in when we go to a uh, go to do aarti tera tujhko arpan kya lage mera my plate mera sab mera hai you say just now you said sab me tera hai then what happened to you tera tujhko don't we run do that in this country no tera at all sab mera hai that we 13 is not there anyway so na cha sanya sanade so merely by renunciation without knowledge you will not reach freedom now the question is what is this freedom is it freedom in the form of being away from things see there are three things you should understand freedom of the mind freedom for the mind freedom in the mind freedom of the mind is what most youth will seek i have should have the freedom to express myself i should have the freedom to do whatever i want this is our idea of freedom gurudev writes in art of living first statement freedom and license if you read that you will understand freedom is not doing whatever you feel like doing that is heritage of the animals whatever you feel like doing that is not freedom that is freedom of the mind freedom from the mind is what freedom from the mind go to sleep <laughs> freedom from the mind the mind is so agitated what do i do oh, go to sleep or take to drugs drink become more spiritual is that what is considered as freedom so freedom of the mind is freedom of speech freedom of expression freedom of whatever i want to do that is not the freedom we are talking about freedom from the mind is that you go to sleep take a drug take narcotics drink whatever you want to do where well, thereby i do not be i would not be disturbed by the mind vedanta talks about freedom in the mind don't escape from this mind don't reject this mind don't try to run away from this mind face it let the thoughts be faced with no desire that is a struggle that is the challenge and that is what is called siddhi 
here in this context. That siddhi, that ability, that freedom, that moksha is only when there is knowledge, not any action. So, na siddhim samadhikachadi sanyasana deva, only by renunciation you will not get that. Renunciation must be followed by or will be accompanied by knowledge of the higher. So therefore, this verse is so beautiful, clears our understanding. Renunciation is not merely not doing action. And renunciation alone is not going to give you freedom. So what you should do? You start from where you are. <laughs> where am I? In the world of action. Okay. Arjuna, you should know how to work without desire. And how do I work without desire? That means I should not plan any work. I should not plan for any result. Wrong. You should plan for action. You should plan for results also. No one can work in this world without thinking about the result. No one can work. But whether the result is selfish or selfless, that is the decision you have to take. Whether you want to own that result or give up, give the result to everybody else, share the result to everyone else. Even in the context of sharing the result with everyone else, don't choose people. And I don't want to, when you should not choose the people, then to whom the result should go? To the Lord. Ishwararpitam na ichaya kritam chitta shodakam mukti sadakam. Bhagavan Ramana Maharshi says in Upadesh Sar, Ishwararpitam, do the action for the Lord. Na ichaya kritam, not doing with the desire. Chitta shodakam, it purifies your mind. Mukti sadakam, it becomes a path to liberation. This is a very precise way of putting the whole of Karma Yoga. So, first of all, I cannot stop thinking about the result before I start working. I should plan my, what is that I want to achieve? All right. Second is, whether that desire you, I mean the result that you are thinking about should not be selfish, meaning it is not for you. Many times what happens, it is not for me, I will not work. <laughs> Take it for example, volunteering. You know, volunteering is a very peculiar job. Why? Why it is so? Because its result is not yours. Then you have a choice of doing or not doing. <laughs> so, karma yoga is volunteering your action or giving your action for the sake of a common goal, not yours. And this common goal also should not be to any particular set of people. If that is so, then still you expect a thanks from them, a reciprocation. At least some other time you expect something in return from them. So best is give to the Lord. Ishwara Arpidam. When you do it for the Lord, then it is not for any individual here. And while doing it to the Lord also, don't expect anything from the Lord also. Bhagavan. Das I am just putting inside the hundi. In Balaji, you know, you go to Tirupati there. You are my business partner. Okay. Abhi Das Asar Jiya, then I read, expect at least five times from that. <laughs> then you are having a business deal with the Lord. You giving up to the Lord is out of gratitude. Grateful attitude. You have given me so much. I am very, very presence of me. Very fact that I am alive is because of you. Therefore, I am not expecting anything in return. I am in fact giving you what you ideally, need, what you call deserve. I am only paying back my debt. So therefore, Ishwara Arpidam is not for expecting anything in return. This is the way you should work in this world. Therefore, he says in the next verse, you see, Tasma dasakta satatam. 
காரியம் கர்ம க சமாச்சர ஆசக்தோக்கியாச்சரன் கர்ம பரமாப்னோதி பூருஷ தஸ்மாத் தேர் போர் சதத்தம் ஆல்வேஸ் சதா ஹர் நிஷம் சர்வதா காரியம் கர்ம சமாச்சர காரியம் கர்ம மீன்ஸ் கர்த்தவியம் கர்ம சமாச்சர வாட் யூ ஷுட் டூ டூ இட் in this you know the every if i go on explaining every word then i am done <laughs> only one or two verses i can do it karyam karma means kartavyam karma you do an action which you are supposed to do huh not whatever you wish to do that is called kamya karma i would like to do that no what you should do that you do because in this world kamya karma is infinite but kartavya karma is finite please understand this point otherwise you know desireful actions are plenty duty is limited why therefore gita is expressing its uh, you know particular teaching of performing your duty because then there is a limitation limitation means only this much you need to do then afterwards you are free instead of doing your duty if you are engaging in whatever you feel like or desire to do no end at all even till the last breath of your life you will be doing something what is your karyan karma kartavya karma what is your duty that you should define your son huh? you understand there are three types of work kamya karma desireful duties huh? nishiddha karma is avoidable duties or actions prohibited actions then karya karma kartavya karma what you should do what you want to do what you should not do what you should do in this first thing you should take up is what you should do if you having finished what you should do then you go to what you want to do and never entertain even in your mind the thought of what you should not do is it not is it not uh, you, know, you may remember seven habits of successful people first come first what does it mean kartavya karma what you should do so that you must accomplish first then if you have time then only you go to the next one kamya karma but what we do is other way around <laughs> what you would like to do we do first Uh, then time hai to we will do what we are supposed to do this is a wrong way of doing things most children also you tell your exams are approaching study and that fellow is seriously studying harry potter <laughs> that is kamya karma <laughs> that is harry potter or hari putra i call it hari putra seriously studying hari putra that is not what you are supposed to do you do your academic study first so that is sir kartavya karma so therefore he says satatam karyam karma samachara how asakta without attachment perform your duty the moment you bring attachment to your performance of your duty it becomes kamya karma so the very first qualification for duty is you should not get attached to it the moment you get attached to that it becomes kamya as a parent what is your kartavya what is your duty should so make sure that your children are given education 
given all the required facility or uh, conveniences so that the child is uh, provided all avenues to learn and grow and values and education etc. That is your kartavya karma. It's not your optional duty. Kartavya. No, because once you are married, once you are having children, then it has become your kartavya. If you do not want to do that, then don't get married. So, moment you have said that I will, you know, you live for me, I live for, I don't know what they, they say, I don't, I don't know anything about that. But whatever you say there, <laughs> you should think before doing that. So, in one church it so happened that before they, you know, declare themselves as, uh, you know, husband and wife, so they ask any objection from anybody. So, the bridegroom said, I have an objection. <laughs> Shut up, you have no objection. Anybody else? <laughs> you cannot have any objection. So, before you engage in a, a particular relationship, you must understand it comes along with certain responsibilities. So once you have declared the responsibility to the entire world, then you have to undertake it. That's why the, nowadays they do it in Jamaica. Nobody comes there. <laughs> because why marriage has to be done in the presence of uh, the society or community? Because the whole society or community people, they reg regard you or recognize you as husband and wife. You do it in Jamaica, some island, nobody is watching. Then tomorrow you say, I never married her and then there is no proof there. So in the <laughs> tradition, you have to call all your friends and relatives and elders and in the presence of the Lord in the form of fire and the sun, you declare that this is my wife and this is my husband. Then you are committed. You declare to the world. You cannot go back on that. Then. So once you have given, taken up a responsibility of a husband or a wife, further as a parent, there are kartavyas, there are duties. So those duties have to be done asaktaha, unattached, without any selfishness. I am doing this duty not for myself, me being a parent, it is my duty to Make sure that the child is given education and all other things. And second aspect is, when you are doing as a duty, you should not expect anything in return. That is called duty. A responsibility you fulfill not to expect anything out of it. Because it is my children and because it is my responsibility to educate the child, therefore I do it. And that there ends it. There ends it. You, know, you just say, oh, I educated you, who should give this back to me? Nothing like that. In fact, it doesn't happen. <laughs> so don't worry about it. <laughs> so just give. <laughs> don't expect anything out of it. Then Bai also says at the end, oh, you are responsible to do it. Why are you asking me anything else? You got me into this world, it is your responsibility to educate me. <laughs> so that is called Kartavya Karma. Karyam karma samachara asakta. So when I do my duties without that attachment, asakto hi acharan, while thus doing my actions without attachment, param apnodi purushaha. Such a person, purushaha, param apnodi. He obtains the highest goal. So Arjuna, you want to reach that shreya, right? Shreya prapti, that is possible only from where you are right now. Do your actions desirelessly as a duty. And especially to Arjuna, he says, you are a king. You are to take care of your citizens. Just like a parent takes care of the child, so are the duties of a king. Just like a king, I mean, just like a, for a janakaha, for a pita or a daughter, I mean, for a father, uh, the children are, huh? children are the responsibility. Similarly, for a Raja, the Prajas. For Raja, the king, the Prajas are his children. His duty to protect them. His duty to educate them. 
So the, it is the government duty to see that the community or the people are educated. That's why education becomes a responsibility of the government. Just like it is education is a responsibility of the father of the child. So therefore, he says, protection also is the responsibility of the king. So you as a king, your duty is to protect your citizens from these people who are negative forces, the Kauravas. Vastasmat asakta satadam karyam karma samachara asakto hi acharan karma param apnodi purushaha. You will reach the highest by doing your work. So therefore, it is a new dimension of thinking because sannyasa is renunciation and karma yoga is performance. As he says, sannyasa is invalid by mere absence of working. Do not take that path, Arjuna, because if you are trying to take renunciation, you are, must have already purified your mind. Your mind should have become desireless. If it is not, then desirelessness has to be made as your nature. To do that, do action and test your mind. Whether the mind is desireful or desireless, only when you perform your duty, you will know how the mind remains desireful or desireless. Then you can evaluate whether you are capable to renounce or not. So therefore, perform your duty. This is also referred as Swadharma. Swadharma, one's own duties. We'll read the next verse here. Shreyan Swadharmo Vigunaha. Paradharma Swanushtitat. Swadharme Nidanam Shreyaha. Paradharmo bhayavaha. When you are born to a particular person as a son or a daughter, you come with some genes, isn't it? <laughs> you are the same genes as your father wears. Sometimes literally also. So you are born to a particular family with a particular background, particular environment, education, everything. Remember, in the past, the society, there was no question of a common education scheme. Education is at a home itself. If you are born to a carpenter, you are educated to be a carpenter. If you are a goldsmith son, you are educated to become a goldsmith son. If you are a Vaidya son, then you are given that knowledge of medicine. If you are a priest son or daughter, then you are given that particular uh, what you call duty. So, therefore, the common education point is not there. Hmm? Understand that scope, I mean the kind of society in which this was taught. Being so, your Swadharma is, you are born to a particular family with certain background of uh, an economic background, educational background, knowledge background. So that particular duty is your scope of work. And that is what is referred as Swadharma. It requires a larger understanding. The very fact that you are born in that house means you are subject to continuing that particular work. And from that standpoint, do not refer to something else as your work. Hmm? In the present context, it may look a little uh, odd because we have a choice. You know, I, if I am a son of a doctor, I can need not be a doctor, I can be a liar, sorry, a liar. So, <laughs> that is, the choice is available. In the past, that choice was not there because there was nobody else will teach you. So I am a son of so and so, that is my scope of work. And what Bhagavan says, in that very action which is your responsibility, which is provided by your family, you can excel. 
Excellence in work does not mean what work you do, but how well you do, whatever you are doing. So, Swadharma is your scope of work decided by the family in which you are born and whatever it be. He does not discriminate between a priest and a scavenger. That is the later politician's idea to just to divide the people. Bhagavan Krishna says any action, whether you are a scavenger or a priest, whether you are a goldsmith or a king, that line, uh, that activity in which you are engaging in, that is your swadharma. Maybe compared to somebody else's job in the society, it may look lower in category. It may give less money for you, less status for you, but he says, do, die in doing your duty. Swadharma nidhanam shreya. That's why he the word used is Shreya. Because what Arjuna asked for, please tell me what is Shreya. What is Shreya? Doing your work is Shreya. And doing somebody else's work, even if it is more attractive, is Payava. Brings you fear. That's why he says, Shreyan Swadharmo. Swadharma is Shreyan, the best. Even if it is vigunaha, meaning even it is without certain qualities which you are looking for in terms of status, money, recognition, name, fame, power, position, authority. Even if it does not give all these things, but doing, because your character is built upon your very environment in which you are born. So that, therefore, shreyan swadharmo vigunaha. But unfortunately, you know, this particular concept of uh, uh, abiding by our Sodharma is removed by the external Western education system where, you know, it is open to anybody learning anything. And therefore, the priestly class, the people who are to do the work of a priest, they are gone into various other fields, Iyengar bakery. <laughs> you, you are a priest and you are supposed to do that work. Why are you starting a confectionery there in your name? Sadhu Bidi. What is the connection? What is the connection between Bidi and a Sadhu? What is the connection? What is the connection? They think all Sadhus are taking Bidi. This is what will happen. And the picture also is Sadhu. What a tragedy it is. Only in India it is allowed, I am telling you. Gandhi liquor store. Poor Gandhi, you know, if he looks at it, he will commit a suicide there. Have you ever seen uh, Jesus Christ liquor shop? Have you seen that? I don't, I have not seen this. Hinduism allows anything and everything. So therefore, you see, your Swadharma is whatever it be, you are a scavenger or a priest or a king or a soldier or a goldsmith, whatever it be. That because the first one is you will naturally get that knowledge because you are born in that environment. Second, the knowledge is coming from your own father or your own elders. It is passed on to you from the very early stages of your life. But when this society changed itself and the structure has changed and anybody can get educated in anything else, this particular concept may not seem to be applicable now. But what now, we let us go on a little further. If you are applying, trying to apply that into present day context, then it means look at what your tendencies are, what is your inclination. It does not matter what your father was or father is doing and what your uh, uncle is doing, doesn't matter. What is your inclination? In, in other words, you have to find your niche. What do you call that? Niche, right? Niche or niche. And many people find their niche only after retirement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, by the time it is useless. You have to find what your inclinations are, in that direction you go. So that becomes your sodharma. 
So he says, Sreyan Swadharma, even if it is Vigunaha, even if it does not give you the required status, name, position, power, etc. Paradharma, then the doing somebody else's job, which is Bhayavaha. It creates fear because you are not qualified for this. Even though it gives more money, more status, more, but you are not qualified for it. In an unqualified situation, you go and there, try to do it, and you will be miserably a failure. So, therefore, Swadharma Nidhanam Shreya. Dying, doing your duty is great. Paradharma Bhayavaha. Paradharma Swanushti, even if you do excellently the other work, but you are, see what, in other words, what we see is your vasanas or tendencies are for a particular task through which alone you can exhaust it. And you, if you don't do it, it will get postponed. And because of which you will have to come back again. You are just postponing your tendencies and because your work does not exhaust it. Therefore, that is waiting, pending there. Your vasanas are not getting an expression there to exhaust. So you may do another work excellently, but even as you are doing that, your vasanas will push you to do what you are supposed to do. That is what is the cause for rebirth. The rebirth is because we are not exhausting our vasanas in the field in which we are supposed to. So we create our next birth through our blueprint of our own tendencies, vasanas. Who creates the next birth? Somebody else? No. Me, by my own thinking, I have already prepared my next birth. And unless I exhaust those vasanas in this life, surely the next one will be decided by unexhausted vasanas and tendencies. So therefore, he says, know yourself in the relative plane, understand your particular role in the society according to your vasanas or tendencies. Doing that is Shreyas. Hey Arjuna, you are a warrior. Not only you are born to a kingly class, but you have the tendency to be a warrior. And therefore, you are in the right place now. You are in the war. That is your, exactly that is a place where you should be. And what is your role as a warrior? To take up a war. And that is what you are into. And therefore, where is the question of you even thinking twice? This is your sadharma. To act to this situation, to protect your citizens and make sure that your country is saved from the hands of the enemies, that is your duty and that is your tendency. And that is what you should do. Desirelessly engage in that action. Without anger and frustration and revengefulness, engage in that action. When you do that, you are on your way to freedom. And later on he said, even if you die in this battlefield, you will become free. And on the other hand, you run away from the battlefield. Even as you don't do your work, you will be bound because your vasanas have not got exhausted. So he advises him, that he should engage in the war. Now he talks about the great enemy within. The real war is within you, Arjuna. That you should understand that we will see tomorrow. Parties.